Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome. My name is Randy Hollerith. I'm the Dean of the Washington National Cathedral. And it is my honor and pleasure on behalf of the Bishop of Washington, Bishop Marianne Buddy, and all of the staff and all of us at the cathedral to welcome you here this evening for this very special program. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for us at the National Cathedral because this event brings together three, three things that are so important to us here at the Washington Cathedral. One is our interfaith work and ministry and growing relationships among the religions of our world, and that is an important piece of the work that we are about here. And so this interfaith uh, event tonight fits into that perfectly. Also, that um, we like to be a convener to discuss important issues, important issues that face our nation, issues of justice and morality, and uh, this, of course, is an issue tonight that we discuss that is so deeply and vitally important. And lastly, we, we see ourselves as a venue for the arts. So a chance to bring all three of these together in one evening is a great joy for us. And so I'm deeply grateful to um, um, Catholic Mobilizing Network and to Equitas and to the Washington National Opera for joining with us in doing this. A partnership is just wonderful. And so I hope you have a wonderful evening. And it's my pleasure now to turn the microphone over to Michael Mayle from the Washington National Opera. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Michael Mayle, Executive Director, Washington National Opera. On behalf of my colleagues and our Artistic Director, Francesca Zambello, we want to add our welcome to this wonderful evening and to offer our thanks as well to the National Cathedral for hosting us and for the Catholic Mobilizing Network for being the inspiration, uh, as addition to our religious leaders who are with us tonight. I want a special notice, of course, to Sister Helen Prejean. We have only known her here at WNO directly for a few days, but she has already proven to be an amazing inspiration to us and to our work at the opera. The catalyst for this evening is, in fact, Washington National Opera's production of Dead Man Walking, which opens at the Kennedy Center on February 25th. Of course, we hope all of you will join us at some point during the run. There are details in the back where our little table is set up. You can learn more about the production and the times that are available for performances. Dead Man Walking is an extraordinary piece of theater and music. It's written by Jake Heggie with a libretto by Terence McNally. It is the single most performed contemporary opera since its premiere in San Francisco in 2000. Though there have been more than 50 productions spying thousands of performances on all continents of the world, it has never been performed here in Washington, D.C. by Washington National Opera or at the Kennedy Center. Three years ago, we made plans to rectify that situation, and here we are three years later as we look forward to the first performances. Rehearsals are underway. You've already had a chance to hear some of the music. We've assembled an outstanding cast in a new production directed by Francesca Zambello. It's a deeply personal and moving story that will be brought to life on the Kennedy Center Opera House stage, and we hope you'll be there to help us celebrate the work. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Karen Clifton, who is head of the Catholic Mobilizing Network. We got a call from Karen about a year ago, talking about a program just like this, and somehow the months have flown by, and here we are. It's a pleasure to have Karen, and thank you so much for helping us put this together. Welcome. I'm so glad to see all of you here. I'm Karen Clifton. I'm with the Catholic Mobilizing Network, a national Catholic organization working to end the use of the death penalty and promote restorative justice. We are inspired by the mission of the Congregation of St. Joseph and work in collaboration with the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. It's my privilege to introduce our two moderators tonight. Sister Helen Prejean will give an introduction to this evening, and E.J. Dion will be our moderator for the panel and for our question and answer. Sister Helen is a sister of the Congregation of St. Joseph, 
and initiated the formation of Catholic Mobilizing Network. She's a longtime, well-known death penalty abolition advocate. She is the author of the, the book, Dead Man Walking, which was later adapted into the Academy Award-winning film and opera by the same name. Since her beginning her journey to abolish the death penalty, Sister Helen has witnessed five executions and today educates the public about the death penalty by lecturing and organizing and writing. She continues to counsel not only inmates, but murder victims' families too. E.J. Dion is a political col columnist for the Washington Post, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, and a university professor at the Foundations of Democracy and Culture at Georgetown University. E.J. has covered state, local, and national politics, as well as served as a, a foreign correspondent, reporting from more than two dozen countries, including serving as a Vatican correspondent. He also analyzes political week, weekly, politics weekly on NPR's All Things Considered and is a regular analyst for MNS, N, MSNBC. He is the author of six books and has edited and co-edited six other volumes. We are so very honored and pleased to have both of them here and bringing their energy and their passion for this issue. Hello. What a, a journey into the heart of the gospel of Jesus this continues to be for me. I'm grateful for the grace that awakened me that the gospel of Jesus was more than about being charitable and being kind, but about working for justice. And that led me in my journey to leave the suburbs where I had been working in a parish, to move into the inner city and for the first time in my life to live among African-American people in New Orleans who, when I was growing up, had been our servants. I grew up in the days in Baton Rouge where African-American people, it was during the Jim Crow laws, served white people, myself. I had grown up as a woman of privilege, a white woman of privilege. And I awakened. And grace, when it wakes us up, it calls us to a deeper dimension to follow Christ. That's what happened to me. I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects. And then African-American people became my teachers. I learned about the other America, who when you don't have a father as a lawyer, and you don't have resources to go to bat for you, and you don't have money to get an education so that you can articulate your position and be an agent of change in the world. I learned, I'm still learning. And while I was there one day, coming out of the Adult Learning Center, I got an invitation from the Prison Coalition Office of Louisiana. Hey, Sister Helen, you wanna be a pen pal to somebody on death row? And everything happened out of that letter. Pope Francis talks about the gospel of encounter, of when we get out of our comfortable circle, the world of people we know, and we venture out into other roads and other people, encounter. That letter then became an encounter from the writing Then I visited with him. Patrick Sonier was the first, and he was executed, and I was there. And it changed my life forever. I'm writing a book now called River of Fire. It's like the prequel to Dead Man Walking. It's the spiritual journey that brought me to the killing chamber. And the prequel in it goes like this. They killed a man with fire one night. They strapped him in a wooden chair and pumped electricity through his body until he was dead. His killing was a legal act because he had killed. No religious leaders protested the killing that night, but I was there. 
I saw it with my own eyes. And what I saw set my soul on fire, a fire that burns in me still. And now here's an account of how I came to be in the killing chamber that night and the spiritual currents of the gospel of Jesus that brought me there. When I came out of that execution chamber, it was the middle of the night. I had never watched a human being be killed before. My journey to Patrick Sonier had also brought me over to the victim's family side. And if you picture the cross, the symbol of Christian salvation, there are two arms on that cross. And I always picture the perpetrator is on one arm of that cross and the victim's family suffering is on the other arm of that cross. And the way our nation has chosen to deal with certain murders we considered worst of the worst is that the ones who have killed the victims deserve to be killed and the government will be the agent of that, will be the deciders of that. And here we are, those of us of religious faith, transfixed between the two and in our own hearts, struggling to find the answer. If somebody killed my child, how would I feel? Isn't this what we have to do to show these murderers that we have to be tough on crime so we can be safe? Our own hearts are all on the journey. What I love about the opera is the opera has taken that spiritual journey and it's gonna bring you through it, not only through drama, that you see it unfolding for your eyes, but through music, which can take us into places of our hearts we don't even know we have. Very dedicated people, opera singers, takes a long time to develop your voice. These people work very, very hard. And we need them. We need art to open up the curtain to bring us to places that we are never gonna go. And I stand as a witness to just share the story. Come with me. Let me tell you what I learned, what I saw. Then you take it. You take it into your own soul. And you, in prayer, work out what is it that we are being called to do. I just want to say in the religious journey, I have had dialogues with two popes, with Pope John Paul, with Pope Francis. Pope Francis was already there solidly on the death penalty. He opened, he spoke about it almost as soon as he became Pope. But the dialogue with Pope John Paul, my question to Pope John Paul II when he was Pope was, Your Holiness, I believe I'm pro-life. I'm pro-life all across the board for life. But I've noticed that, that many of our Catholics, many of us say, well, I'm I'm against abortion. I'm for innocent life, the dignity of innocent life. But these murderers, they deserve what they get. And I want to ask you, Holy Father, to help us as Catholics to go on this journey. And when I'm walking with a man to execution, even those who are guilty, when I'm walking and he's shackled hand and foot and he's been rendered defenseless, and they're about to take him and kill him. And he says to me, Sister, please pray God holds up my legs. Where is the dignity in this death? Do we as Catholics only believe in the dignity of innocent life? But what about someone who is guilty of a crime? Does he not or she not have a dignity that no one can take from them? Is there a dignity in rendering a human being defenseless and strapping them down and killing them? Where's the dignity? Can you help us? Can you help us as Catholics get there that pro-life means not just innocent life, but guilty life? And Pope John Paul did that, and Pope Francis is doing that. But mainly, it's the people. It's always about the people, educating and being with the people. The American people have good hearts. We're not a mean people who want to see people be killed for what they did. But it's not an issue we think deeply about and we never see it. So who better to bring it close to us than the opera 
of Dead Man Walking. I, I want to make you a promise that you, if you attend and a part of that journey, you are not going to come out of it in the same way you went into it, and it's going to occupy your mind and heart for a long time to come. Thank you for being here tonight. We have a wonderful panel of all different faiths to share with us, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. The definition of life being unfair is to have to follow Sister Helen. Uh, and as we Catholics say, I hope that will reduce my time in purgatory. Uh, it is such an honor to be here with her. I think one of the reasons Sister Helen is such a powerful witness is that her compassion and her concern is all-inclusive. She's said that outrage is an ethical way to feel about the death of innocent people. It's what we do with that outrage that matters. And she said of herself, I try to follow the way of Christ, the way of nonviolence, the way of justice to peace. And I try to follow Christ's example of speaking out when confronted with injustice. Bless you, Sister Helen, and thank you. Um, it is such an honor to be here. I want to thank Karen. Uh, Clifton for inviting me. Uh, many of you know the book Eat, Pray, Love. When Karen writes her book, which I hope she does, it will be called Pray, Love, Organize. And thank you for the work you do uh, as an organizer. And thank you for the privilege. This is an amazing night because move, music moves our hearts. Uh, we have this extraordinary group of panelists who will move our minds and consciences. And we are in this extraordinary sacred place that will move our spirit. Um, and what brings us together is a very simple view. I always thought that a button that I saw about 30 years ago actually summarized the argument that uh, people will be making tonight as well as anything. The button said, why do we kill people who kill people to show that killing people is wrong? And that's why we're gathered here together tonight. And we have a group of um, speakers here uh, who are going to talk personally about why this question has come uh, to matter to them. Um, and I want to invite you, by the way, to you'll have some cards uh, circulating. And as they inspire you and move you, please feel free uh, to pass up your questions and your thoughts, and we'll try. Uh, to share them uh, after we're going to have a discussion, then another aria, and then we will go to the Q&A. Uh, and so one by one, they're going to come uh, and bear witness. Uh, bishop Marianne Buddy is the bishop of uh, the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, uh, D.C. You are hosting us here. Um, she is the first woman elected to this position, and she also sh serves as the chair and president of the Protestant Episcopal Cathedral Foundation. Uh, then will come Bishop Frank DeWayne. He is the Bishop of the Diocese of Venice, Florida. He is the chair of the Justice, Peace, and Human Development Committee of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and has served as an official delegate of the Holy See to numerous international conferences and world summits. Rabbi Hannah Goldstein is an associate rabbi at Temple Sinai here in Washington. Uh, rabbi Goldstein focuses on social justice work at Temple Sinai, as well as education for learners of all ages. I like that idea. Um, Imam Yahya Hindi is my colleague at Georgetown. He is the Muslim chaplain at Georgetown University and president of the, we, we were talking about what a wonderful name this is for an organization. He is president of Clergy Beyond Borders. Uh, in 2012, um, Imam Hendi was named one of the world's most 500 influential Muslims for his work as an, uh, di an interfaith dialogue activist and trainer. trainer. Dr. Uma Mysore is the president of the Hindu Temple Society of North America, 
a successful gynecologist and oncologist since 1970. Um, Dr. Amaya Sorakar uh, has also been widely recognized for both her interfaith and cultural activities while with the Hindu Temple Society of North America. And another old friend, Dr. the Reverend Dr. Gabriel Salguero, is president of the National Latino Evangelical Coalition. He is also pastor of the Calvario City Church in Orlando, Florida. Reverend Salguero's leadership of the National Evangelical Coalition offers, an, he, in, in his leadership, he offers, offers an important voice for the growing diversity and changing demographics of our nation. Uh, Bishop Buddy will begin. My only authority to speak to you tonight is in the ability to answer the question that was posed to us all. How did each one of us individually come to our position in opposition to the death penalty? I was in high school when the death penalty was reinstated after its brief suspension by the Supreme Court in the 1970s. And I don't remember any discussion about it in my family, but if there had been discussion, I'm certain my father would have been in favor of the death penalty because it fit into his worldview that there were bad people in the world deserving punishment, retribution was okay with him, and the state's responsibility was to protect good people from bad people. And so bad people were to be locked away in prison. And and it would be okay to kill them because that would be a deterrent for other bad people and the ultimate protection against the bad things that they had done. And vengeance was, was okay too, that, that vengeance was a justifiable position in response to horrible things that happened to us as human beings. And what I remember of my own thinking as a young person is that I was, I was ambivalent about all of this. I remember hearing about crimes so heinous and murders so callously committed that the death penalty, if maybe it wasn't okay, but it wasn't the worst thing that could happen. But I also, as a young person, I remember an uneasiness about all of this as well because I knew that there were cases of innocent people uh, convicted of crimes they didn't commit. And, and what did that say about the rightness of all of this? And, um, and what if it isn't an effective deterrent for wrongness? And, and, and the practices of the death penalty bordered on the grotesque, and why was it always hidden in darkness? As I became a committed follower of Jesus of Nazareth, and I immersed myself in time over time in his teachings and the arc, the moral arc of the Hebrew and Christian sacred texts, the sacredness of human life and the principles about that um, became embedded in me. Jesus' own teachings, his respect for life, but you know, it was the one story that sort of did it for me. It's the story of the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Do you remember that one? Um, the punishment for a woman caught in the act of adultery was to be stoned to death. And Jesus said to those about to do that, well, if any of you are without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And that cut to the core of something I knew wasn't was ultimately true, that there weren't good people and bad people in the world. There were people with goodness and badness um, potential in all of us. It became impossible for me to divide the world. And I have lived the rest of my life in awe of the inspiring goodness that human beings are capable of and humbled by the incomprehensible evil and everything in between the reality of our flawed, broken nature and our capacity for grandeur. 
Now, the closer you get to the death penalty, the, the easier it is to be against it. Right? And so as you live your life and you study um, what its history is, um, the bumbled nature of it, the number of people who are caught up in it, who are in fact innocent, it gets easier and easier to be against the death penalty. And for me, and I'll, I'll end my remarks here, it is Brian Stevenson, our most um, inspired lawyer in fighting for, for the rights of people in, caught up in the quagmire of our justice system when he says that, you know, each person is more than the worst thing that he or she has ever done. We're all more than that worst thing. And he also says, and I, I believe this is true, that it isn't so much if a person deserves to die, and that is up to God alone to decide, but do we have the right to kill? And there is nothing about our record on that as a people in state-sanctioned killing that would convince me as a follower of Jesus that we have that moral right. And in fact, everything that the evidence suggests would say the contrary. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> As was noted, our kind of charge this evening is to talk about what has been our journey to this point in our life, each of the speakers, to convince us to be in opposition to the death penalty and to see the evil that it is. Um, and you know, I, I think before I was asked to do this, I did, really didn't reflect upon that. I knew that I was, but why? And I have to be grateful to the organizers who asked us to do that. It caused me to pause and think about my own life. How did I get to that point? Grew up on a farm in Wisconsin, cold weather. I'm happy I'm in Florida now. But back there on the farm, I learned a tremendous respect for life. It wasn't a lecture. It wasn't a, an epiphany moment when I suddenly knew. It was just living every day. And it wasn't just about life in terms of human beings. I was raised in a family that I had uh, three siblings and two parents who were very much, you could say, rooted in their faith. And we did things together as a family. Uh, we were busy on the farm. But you learn quickly the value of God's creation. Everything that God had created. The animals, okay, there was an end product. Principally, it was a dairy farm. And uh, the milk went to a cheese factory. But the important thing when a calf was born, the value of that, the life of the animal, and that the mother survive and be healthy, I learned a great deal from that. Uh, in terms of the corn, the crop had to be in. If a storm came through, if there was hail, it would rip the corn, the leaves, if it started to grow. Production would be reduced. But still, that was God's creation. And in terms of the, the cycle of life, if you want to put it, it contributed and was to contribute to the growth of the animals. And consequently, I guess, to my own well-being and growth. As one matures, and that's the mind of a child, you see these things, you experience it daily. It doesn't suddenly hit you, it becomes part of you. I think that's very true because I had a father who was not only a gentleman, but a very gentle man in, in teaching these kinds of things, and certainly not with the club, but just letting you absorb it, talk about it, and then see it. You know, there was that, that nasty rooster that chased me around the, the hen house just to pursue. And I kind of wanted to hurt that animal. Okay, no, that wasn't the way. And I also had the idea that weren't we going to butcher some of the chickens? 
No, that wasn't the one. Just that was the respect. So there was no epiphany moment. It came about to me in my life as gift, as gift from my parents. Later you would grow up and you hear about crime and some individuals, and um, I wish I had only been in high school in those early 70s. I was a little past that point. But with the law changed, that wasn't what I had learned. That wasn't gentle at all. And it certainly didn't respect life. I have to admit, it would be some years just in a growing process, and I'm not going to take you through that, but to come to the full realization that, no, I, I, despite that I had friends who were trial lawyers and so on and so forth, yes, if this individual does this, this should be the conclusion. I didn't think it should be. And when I sat, and we all probably watched television, Pope Francis appeared before Congress. There he was in his white cassock, all the colored suits out before him and different kinds of attire. And he basically said, you know, he renewed the call for the globalization of an abolition of the death penalty. Had to be done away with. Sister spoke about his comments and it's something he knew and understood. Uh, I, if we go back and we really study the issue and take the time, you find Thomas Aquinas. You come forward to St. John Paul II. I did have the opportunity to sit with him at some meetings because of a position and hear him speak about that. Pope Francis also, in a speech one time to the San Egidio committee, community, spoke very clearly about the rejection of the death penalty. So these are the points that in life have confirmed to me and how I, I think I came about in that journey, coming to the conviction, it's not right. The death penalty is wrong. As much as maybe I wanted to get even with that, that rooster that chased me around, I learned at that moment, not mine to do. It's done in another way. I'm sure you've all had a similar experience, and I thank you for this time to share mine. God bless you. Similar to the bishop, both bishops actually, who went before me, um, the question made me think. I felt that I knew the answer. I've never supported the death penalty, but being asked the question made me think back on the journey and how I arrived at that belief. Um, and I think a big part of that is that my father is also a rabbi. He's a reform rabbi. And I grew up with the values of the reform movement everywhere in my life. I was steeped in those values. And so my story is also a Jewish story, a story that um, reflects the evolved views of the Jewish community. Um, the reform movement, the largest Jewish denomination in North America, has opposed the death penalty for nearly 60 years. We believe that no crime without exception justifies the taking of a human life and that capital punishment is a stain on civilization and the religious conscience. And Judaism as a whole has rejected capital punishment for 2,000 years. In our High Holy Day liturgy, we pose the question as we look ahead to the new year, who shall live and who shall die? And this is not a question that we put before each other. It is solely a question that we put before God. But in spite of our longstanding opposition to the death penalty, the Bible is quite clear in regard to capital punishment. Not only is it admissible, it is the required punishment for 36 offenses. According to the Torah, death is a perfectly acceptable consequence for a variety of wrongdoings. But in Jewish law, the Torah is just the beginning. The Talmud, the foundational collection of Jewish law recorded over the course of the first century CE, is fascinated by capital punishment and works to limit its application almost entirely. There is a great deal of Talmudic text worrying and considering how to inflict the death sentence, but then they work to undermine themselves 
to limit when you can actually use it. And they didn't actually have the power to do so because Roman authorities had taken this power away. So beyond their curiosity about the technicalities of the death penalty, the rabbis were uncomfortable with the legal process of actually sentencing someone with the death penalty. From Talmudic times through modern day, one of the prevailing problems with capital punishment is conducting a fair trial resulting in just sentencing. The rabbis recognize human fallibility and the impossible challenge of creating a justice system that is absolutely just. Here's how the rabbis limited the death penalty. First, the death penalty could only be administered by the Sanhedrin, an ancient Jewish court that was dismantled in 425 CE. And in order for a case to result in the death penalty, there had to be two witnesses. These two witnesses not only had to testify that they witnessed the act the accused was being charged with, they also had to testify that they had tried to warn the accused ahead of time that their crime would result in execution. And they had to testify that the accused had acknowledged the warning, recognizing that they were committing the act fully aware of the consequences. So the rabbis required a lengthy pre-crime conversation that is almost impossible to imagine actually occurring. All this is to say that the rabbis recognized the human error that was possible when convicting someone of a crime. Taking another life could not be subject to uncertainty. And more practically, once the Sanhedrin was dismantled, most Jewish legal texts argue that there is no place that a capital trial can be held. As I mentioned, Reformed Jews in America have stood in strong opposition to the death penalty for nearly 60 years. The Union of American Hebrew Congregations, now, now called the Union for Reformed Judaism, issued a resolution in 1959, which is in your programs, and that statement has been reaffirmed over time, most recently in 1999. Personally, this is not an issue about which I have ever experienced any uncertainty. I have faith in humans' capacity for teshuva, for turning away from sin. I am a believer that there is no situation that merits taking another life as a form of punishment. But like the rabbis before me, my greatest qualms about the death penalty come from fears about its implementation. The death penalty is just one facet of a criminal justice system that is broken and discriminatory. I too was influenced by Brian Stevenson and his teaching about the pervasiveness of discrimination in capital cases. This week, Jews around the world read this from the book of Exodus and will read the miracle of God parting the sea, allowing the Israelites to cross over to freedom on dry land. And we'll read that the Egyptians were close behind and God allowed the sea to close, drowning all of the pursuing Egyptians. There is a Midrash, a Jewish story that teaches that the Israelites celebrated when they saw that the Egyptians had drowned. But God responds harshly to their celebration. God said, my creation is drowning and you are singing. We cannot be cavalier about human life. We are taught in the book of Genesis that humans were created but selim Elohim in the image of God. And for the past 2,000 years, with only extreme rare exception, Jewish law has not permitted humans to extinguish the divine spark in one another as a form of punishment. Thank you. my sisters and my brothers. Many years ago, I traveled to America with the dream of becoming a citizen of the great United States of America. I was told back home that in America, life is valued. So I ran away from a region where life is not as valued 
to a country where I was told every life is valued. I saw so many of my Muslim sisters and brothers also fleeing or running away from regions or countries where death penalty is carried out by political regimes with little justice or no justice that claim the lives of thousands of thousands of innocent women and men. People who came to America because of the great, great dream of America. I myself remember when my sheikh, my imam who was training me to become an imam told me, Yahya, you have no bread here to eat. Your presence and you can be a successful imam only in a country where there is no death penalty. This was almost 27 years ago. I came to America to pursue the American dream where I had hoped would learn how America would do this so that I would go one day back to the region and teach them how they can best eliminate and fully suspend death penalty. To my shock, to my surprise, when I came to our beautiful America and realized that death penalty is actually in practice and that actually people are dying in the name of the legal system or the state that actually executes people for a crime, may have committed or not committed. I am a chaplain. I have worked as a chaplain for so many years and therefore by default I counsel men and women. And where I decided to become a part of this great movement to eliminate death penalty is when I saw the impact of it on the relatives of some of those who have received the death penalty and have actually died or people who are waiting for the execution of the order of the court or the state. It was often heartbreaking when I had to go home feeling powerless. I need to do something and I could do nothing. And the big twist, the big change in my life came when I came across a study of how many people have been sentenced either to death or to life in a prison to crimes they have not committed. I thought if we are speaking on behalf of God, if we are true clergy who are meant to carry out the pro prophetic voice of God, of our prophets, of our scriptures, we have to stand up and make a difference. As a Muslim, shaped by my own tradition, by my own faith, we teach that God has so many attributes, the most important of which are al-adl and al-rahmah, justice and compassion. And therefore, in every act we do, we have to make sure that justice is served and compassion is done. And I truly believe that in death penalty, often neither is served. In Islam, it teaches that even if some has committed a crime of murder and acknowledged it, he or she should be given the opportunity to tawbah, to maghfirah, to repentance. And that the state and the community have to rally around that person to help him or her become a part of the community again in what has historically been called rehabilitation centers through faith and community. 
my brothers and my sisters, the story of Abel and Cain in the Quran has so much to teach us as it is in the Bible. But the most important of which is that no one has the right to claim any life except the one who made that life possible, and that is God. In the Quran, in the story of, this, uh, of Abel and Cain, we are told that we are created in the image of God and that God breathes into each and every one of us of God's spirit. And therefore, in sentencing someone to death and making the decision, we have premeditated a crime against God, God's self. And therefore, here and tonight, I call upon my Muslim sisters and brothers and every other fellow human being to work hard to ensure that the dignity of every life is honored as God wants it to be honored. And that is by suspending all the practices that lead to death penalty or capital punishment. That's my cry out to you because I know that so many states have carried out this penalty wrongly and unjustly. And I believe that united we stand, divided we fall. And if we come together, fully committed to the human life of every person, ensuring that they come back to the society productive, this movement will produce the fruits it started or had hoped to do. Thank you. Good evening and namaste to all of you. I thank Karen for inviting me to this august panel in front of this distinguished audience to discuss a subject which is still being taught. Sometimes I wonder at this day and age that we still talk of death penalty. Hinduism is, as you know, one of the oldest, if not the oldest religion Interestingly, the scriptures in Hinduism do not make any specific statements either for or against death penalty. However, the teachings of Hinduism itself is so classic. The fundamental tenet is nonviolence or ahimsa. Doctrine of karma and doctrine of dharma. And not last but not the least is the divinity which is present in each and every one of us. All lives matter. And all lives are equal. Every living being has to be respected. No one has a right to take the life of another. And this is what we need to practice. When I used to sit as a physician, when I used to sit and talk some about some, some of these matters with some of my patients, because they had come to know of someone who had been on the death row. And it used to bother me so much that here we are trying to save lives, but there they are trying to kill lives. How is this balance ever possible? As a young physician, moving along with the rest of the society, having come to this country rather fresh about 40 years ago, I used to discuss in many of the interfaith meetings in those days, but no answer ever came. But it makes me feel a little bit satisfied today that many people, not only here but elsewhere, have begun to realize that even the leaders who constantly think of three main issues, which is the morality, perhaps the, the morality of whether or not one should even think of death penalty, closure for families, that was one of the most important subjects that was discussed, is it true that if a loved one is lost due to a murder, that by ordering death penalty to the culprit, would it be a closure for the families? In my opinion, it is not. It is something that they will carry the rest of their lives also. The doctrine of karma which says that you not only perform the bad deed which you will carry with you, but also witnessing, being a part of it, 
also make you carry this bad karma. If you were to follow dharma, which is righteousness, it's important for us to realize that as many of them have echoed already, every life is important. And I think it is the will of the Lord to decide who has done right and who has done wrong. As human beings, it is not fair for us to decide as to who should be put to death. It is difficult for us to sit and argue this with someone who's lost loved ones. Recently, as we all heard on the news, a young woman's body which was found, they found, they think they found the culprit. You feel sorry, anger, why did this happen? But anger shouldn't go to the extent of even thinking that this young man, for whatever reason he did what he did, should be put to death. I think so, as many have echoed already, I would like to make an appeal to every one of you here and far beyond that every one of us has to try very hard in all respects possible to actually abandon this death penalty. Thank you. Buenas noches, good evening. I'd like to thank Ms. Clifton, the Catholic Mobilizing Network, Equitas, Washington National Opera, and of course, the Washington National Cathedral. I am honored to be with this distinguished panel and honored to be with my friend E.J. Dion and my sister for the last several years, Sister Helen Prejam. I'm a Pentecostal pastor. Pentecostal is part of the family of evangelicalism in the United States of America. There are close to six million Latino, Latina evangelicals living in the United States. And for the last several years, the coalition which I serve, we've been on a journey on trying to be the first national coalition of evangelical congregations to publicly oppose the death penalty and capital punishment. The journey of our coalition has also been a very personal journey. In honor of the opera, I'd like to define my personal journey in response to this question in three acts. The rabbi whom I met before in the early dinner. She said that the, there was a very stringent requirement to execute the death penalty. And she said that the actual perpetrator had to be warned uh, of the consequences that they would be executed. And I was reminded of one of our great poets, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Crónicas de una muerte anunciada. Chronicles of a death foretold. It seems to me he was deeply influenced by the rabbis. <laughs> and it seems to me that also we Hispanic evangelicals, Latina, Latina evangelicals can learn much from our sisters and brothers and friends from other traditions. Act one, Fernando Bermudez, because we were entering into a multi-year conversation about the death penalty and what we as a coalition of Latino evangelicals and Pentecostals will respond. Fernando came to speak to us in Princeton, Princeton Theological Seminary. Fernando is an articulate, handsome, intelligent young man who was sentenced to 23 years plus two life. He served 18 years before he was exonerated for a murder he did not commit. The system makes mistakes. Often those mistakes are on the backs of the poor, the undereducated, and people of color. But there are mistakes that are irreversible. They should not be done in our name. Fernando, his wife and his children reminded us of that. 
and for an hour we heard of the promise of Fernando, of how he wanted to go to university and how he spent much of his young life in a very isolated place because he was arrested, misidentified, and found guilty. Act two. Outside of Chicago, Illinois, in the citadel of what is much of evangelical higher education, Wheaton University, they asked me to serve on a panel about the death penalty. Some came favoring it for theological or sociological reasons they thought were justified, and some like me already convinced of the immorality of a broken system came to oppose it. On the panel with me was a warden who served in a prison where they executed people. And he stands up after many years and he tells the story of officers who were required to execute in the name of the state the ultimate punishment. Nightmares. Torment in the soul. Often their families are shattered because in the name of the state they were called to execute another fellow human being. And this warden in Act 2 speaks on behalf of those we put the unspeakable burden of executing another person. Please, no le demos ese cargo de conciencia. Let us not give that burden of conscience. Act three, Florida. Orlando, Florida. Our board meets together to decide Will we, as a board, oppose the death penalty? 40 pastors from across the country, evangelical, all of them, Texas, Florida, New Jersey, California, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Washington, DC. And before we vote, our lawyer, David Donato, he's our immigrant and refugee lawyer for now, like stands up, and he reads from the Hebrew prophet Ezekiel. Porque Dios llora en la muerte aún de los que han hecho mal. For God weeps at the death even of us who have done evil acts. And then he says, my brother was murdered. But I want to take the first vote against the death penalty. Because the execution, the sentence, of my brother's murderer did not bring me peace. I suffer still. But I want to announce to the world that we value life, even to the ones who've done the most evil thing. We voted unanimously to oppose the death penalty. <laughs> the prequel. I, like the rabbi, am a pastor's kid. She would be a rabbi's kid. She's an RK, I'm a PK. <laughs> but the prequel to my father, who's a pastor, is a young man named Hector. In Ponce, Puerto Rico, who grew up around violence, drug addiction, heroin, the drug of his choice, incarcerated, for serious violent crimes, for distributing narcotics, till one day a woman came to his prison cell and said, Hector, anyone can change. Anyone can change if given the opportunity. Hector believed her. Hector changed his life. Hector became a pastor, my pastor. Hector's my father. Hector was the first to sign because he believes people can change. Anyone can change.
Thank you so much to this extraordinary panel. I, if there is an evening that could fairly be described as preaching to the choir, uh, I think this is it. We even brought our own choir uh, as part of the preaching. And I think that occurred to a number of the people um, who sent up questions. There was one particularly directed to Sister Helen. There are some mics there for everyone to use and share. Um, I'd like if anyone else had a thought on this. I want to ask this question and append a question to it. Um, and I, I, and it, it comes from the idea uh, that there may be a lot of people who are persuaded that the death penalty is wrong. In fact, the ranks of those who oppose the death penalty in the United States are growing. Uh, the trend has been toward opposition, not toward support. Nonetheless, there is still a great deal of support. And so one questioner asked before I get to the question for Sister Helen, what has been your best experience in educating people of faith about the death penalty, examples to model or try in our community? Um, and another questioner asked, um, this question applies to any controversial or polarizing issue, certainly the death penalty, how do we draw those opposed to our point of view into meaningful dialogue? And therefore, asking the most difficult questions is part of that. And this question is someone who asked that uh, he or she be identified as a 1982 graduate of St. Joseph's Academy in Baton Rouge. Uh, and the question is, what do you say to families of murder victims um, who, um, uh, what do you say that they find hardest to accept. And I was going to ask a very similar question, which is a person of goodwill whose loved one has been suffered from a heinous death and who says, I understand the evil of the death penalty and yet no other penalty seems sufficiently just to me. Um, so I'd like to ask Sister Helen a particular question from the St. Joseph's Academy grad. Uh, the toughest e experience, um, you know, what you say to the, these families that they find hardest to accept, and then ask others uh, if they want to come in on the question of vengeance, on the question of um, how do you respond to a person of goodwill who still believes that the death penalty in some, perhaps, particular, def particular defined cases is the only just penalty? Sister Helen. Uh, of all the people I have met, victims' families that are in great, great pain and who say to me, I want to see that person killed. I wish I could kill them with my own hands. When they are speaking out of deep pain of loss and outrage, there is nothing I say to them except to say, you are in deep pain. I haven't known that pain because I haven't had a loved one killed, but I just want you to know that I'm praying for you and standing by your side and accompanying you in the best way I can. But it's never to try to say to a person, or God help us as some ministers have done, with a facile answer of, well, you know Jesus calls you to forgive. You know that forgiveness is going to be your peace. Like, this is what the task you got to do. Who are we to speak anything when people are in such suffering except to acknowledge that out of their pain, they are calling for another death? When a person's in that kind of grief and anger and pain, I know that that's not the time to talk to them about what is going to be for their peace unless they bring it up later. Now, when I'm dealing with an American audience and with an audience of people who've got to make that journey, to just, we have to go there with them, and I do it through storytelling. I do it through telling stories of people. Those who were for the death penalty stayed, saw the execution, kept being for the death penalty, and victims' families who made their way out of the vengeance and moved to another place, which was more peaceful. And the victims' families have been our witnesses 
in this country helping to change things for us. So when New Jersey, I'll end with this, when New Jersey did away with the death penalty in their legislature, when they were having the debates, 62 murder victims' families testified saying the death penalty re-victimizes us. It does not end our pain. They have to be the witnesses who can speak to that, I think. Does anyone? Yeah. I often uh, find myself having to, to talk about my own story. I know firsthand of people who suffered the death of relatives and very close friends. But uh, having known these people for many years, I believe that in the long picture, 30 or 40 years down the road, it is those who have decided to forgive who felt redemption and peace in their hearts. Of course, in Islam, we speak about how revenge belongs to God and to God alone. However, on the other hand, I think the way to respond is to acknowledge the pain in the relatives or the friends of the victim. By not acknowledging their pain, we're not helping them. However, we need to give them an alternative of how that pain could become a rehabilitating, re revival spiritual journey for them. The Quran says, you are told an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. As if God is acknowledging that that's what they want to happen. However, the Quran says, and I, God, say, if you forgive, you will find that with me, a course that will allow you to find life in heavens. Bishop, before you speak, let me um, append a question that was directed specifically to you because it may relate to your answer. Um, it's, uh, uh, the, the question was, how do we reconcile the God of justice and the law with the God of compassion and mercy? Um, I'll come back to that yeah. just to respond a little bit. Um, the first question related to not just the families of the victim, but friends of ours. And I think there's that pool out there who, well, they're close, but they're not quite opposed to the death penalty. They see cases where it can be acceptable. And these are friends, we all know people like this, or statistics wouldn't tell us what they are today. My point is, at least in the church, the punishment must be restorative and reformative. And I think we don't talk enough about these kinds of things. Death penalty uh, pushes past both of them. There's no chance. So I think with friends, we need to reach out to that. Okay, I leave that point there. That's something that, once again, preaching to the, to the choir in that you are of a mind but we have to, each one of us, go out and, if you want to say, evangelize our friends on this issue. Um, it, it is the people that will change it. That was said earlier. Uh, EJ, to come back to the other question you read out, uh, the God of justice and the God of mercy, um, I'm not certain they're contradictive. In our own minds, we set them up, one juxtaposed to the other. I think in the year of mercy, that Pope Francis led us through, we, we saw that and we heard that addressed any number of times where the Holy Father put an emphasis on the mercy that God gives, and that's the form of his justice in many instances. It is his mercy. So I think sometimes it's our human categorizing of it or our intellectual way to do it. God doesn't know those same kind of boundaries, and I think our Holy Father tried to encourage us to see it and not let ourselves be trapped by one or the other. Rabbi, could I ask you the same question, the, the God of justice and mercy? Sure. Um, 
I would agree. I mean, I, I think that it is a false dichotomy that we think about justice and mercy as so separate from each other. Um, and that part of justice is, um, like the imam taught us, is, is the belief that people can change and that they can redeem themselves and that they can turn from their wrongdoing. Um, and that justice is, is actually a form of mercy, that helping someone to see, uh, to lead them towards the right path and then allowing them to walk that path rather than taking away that opportunity is where justice and mercy actually meet. Thank you so much. By the way, thank you to people in the audience. I had a bunch of questions I wanted to ask tonight and you all asked them better. So I have them here and I apologize to anyone who, whom I don't include because there are a big stack of questions but I'm trying to bring a few ideas together at once. Um, this, is a, this is a really interesting question for Dr. Uh, Mysore Carr. Um, I was fascinated by the idea of bad karma being carried also by those who witness a bad deed. Can the idea extend to a public that stands by as the death penalty stands? And then let me ask a second question to bring a couple other people in after you. Um, maybe I'll address this to um, um, the bishop and Gabe and then anyone else who wants to come in it. It was the, a question that I very much had in mind. I'll read it, this version, which is the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim scriptures all support the historical practice of a person of faith, um, uh, uh, their, their historical practice of the death penalty, I think is implicit here. As a person of faith, how can you um, explain how these documents are relevant now? Um, I was going to ask a similar question differently, which is, um, you know, if I am a member of your tradition and say for a long, long, long time, and right there in the books, it says that the death penalty is justified, um, how is it in keeping with our tradition now to say actually the death penalty violates our tradition? Uh, I'm, Sister Helen has such a smile on it, she might want to come in on that too. But um, please, Dr. Karma. Yes, the, the doctrine of karma is um, essentially for those who participate, actually perform the act, those who witness the act, and those who are probably around. Whether or not the public is involved is a debatable question. Public is truthfully not involved in this. And I think it is not as simple as we can just define in a sentence or two. The doctrine of karma really means both good and bad, in this case, it is something that we are witnessing that we are not supposed to do. Therefore, we carry this bad karma with us. It gets accumulated and we are going to pay for it at the end of the day. Whether it is paid in this life or next life, it is, we don't know. But we all will pay for it. So as far as the public participating, there have been a lot of debates. I have read a lot of uh, references to it. The public have nothing to do with it. Just like we're all sitting here debating this very important question. And most of us, I assume almost all of us, perhaps are not in favor of death penalty. But yet, there are states which do perform this death penalty. And we are a public. And it's not that we are witnessing it, but we know that such a thing has happened. We may or may not agree with it, but then we are not a part of it. Therefore, bad karma doesn't come into that picture. I just wanted to add uh, one small uh, thing here is it's, somebody has already echoed the statement just to repeat that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Therefore, retribution uh, is something that one should not ever consider. Retribution is because somebody has lost a loved one and therefore just to compensate their pain, the culprit should be put to death. And I think this is where somebody, uh, Sister Helen has mentioned so clearly, that we need to be able to support them, not so much spiritually, I tell you. And at stage when they are in such a stage, you talk about God and you talk about forgiveness, you talk about all of these, it has no meaning. But I think more of your moral friendship, your support, your assistance will make them feel better and therefore will be able to accept uh, any other decision other than a death penalty. Thank you. Um, does somebody want to deal with the tradition question? Yeah, Gabe? Okay. Uh, Bishop first. 
Well, as, as the rabbi indicated with the Talmudic conversation with the Torah, all of, our, all of our scriptural traditions are in dialogue with one another. There are many voices, many conversations that we're privileged to take part in, and we can see how our ancestors also struggled with some of the very moral dilemmas that we have, and in the scriptures there's often more than one answer to any number of things, and we're left to jump into the conversation from our perspective and try to discern, um, try to discern the will of God and the aspirations that are of um, clearest moral standing in the arc of those, of that great tradition. Uh, Jesus is pretty clear, and so Christians are always left with the dilemma when we try to justify anything other than a, a very strict pacifist, nonviolent position on anything based on the example of Jesus because of the way he lived his life. Now, that doesn't mean that Christians don't come down on any position relative to the taking of a human life, but it is... Um, it's challenging to do when you're faced with his example, and I would say that um, that's part of the, um, the contribution that Jesus makes, his un, unflinching call for mercy and forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with the good bishop. I think that we have, all of our traditions have a history of interpretation and, and how we deal with that. Uh, but to borrow from, from my Catholic colleagues, St. Augustine would always ask us, what is the summa bonum? What is the highest good? And, and that there, there is a hierarchy of good uh, that we, as a society, we as individuals, we as families, should pursue. And, and I think that, you know, Zoe, life, is the highest good. And, and Christ was clear on this issue for us as Christians Christ is the is the primary example of what a Christian ethic should be and it's not lost on me as a Christian that the one we serve as Lord and Savior was executed by a state sponsored and state sanctioned execution even though he was innocent so that the doctrine of sin and structural sin and that we live in fallen systems that disproportionately execute innocent people um, and poor people, and even people who've done heinous things without the chance of restorative and redemptive justice. All of that, that uh, confluence, you add that all up, and that leads us to this, to, or leads me to this perspective of saying, uh, w we can't get behind it. Thank you. I am told I have about two minutes left, not even that, and I have a pile of questions, so I'm going to combine two thoughts, and I can't even ask every, I think all our panelists have answered something. I may, um, and I think you'll forgive me, uh, direct both of these to Sister Helen uh, to close. Um, w there is a whole set of questions about what are the alternatives to the death penalty. And one questioner refers to a gentleman called Mr. Henry Montgomery, who's been in prison for 53 years, sentenced to life without parole. Many of us who oppose the death penalty have argued for a long time without life without parole, in favor of life without parole. Uh, this questioner challenges us further by saying, does life without uh, parole actually treat uh, individuals with dignity? There was a question on race and the death penalty. And the last one, and you can combine all this in a brilliant short answer, I am sure. Um, <laughs> What is the most effective, best thing I can do as an ordinary person? What should I do? So preach, Sister Helen. <laughs> Let's deal with race first. Race comes out in the death penalty as who the victim is. What victims do we care about? Overwhelmingly, it's when white people are killed that the death penalty is sought. When people of color are killed, it's a negligible Death is no outrage because it's a negligible life. That's the way life is, overwhelmingly, in the criminal justice system. Read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. Overwhelmingly, people have been thrown into prison but for drugs, 
often nonviolent offenses. It was simply drugs, and that has been what has been used to have massive incarceration of our citizens. Sentencing a person to the death penalty to be killed by the state or sentencing them to death in prison, and when you look at the high number of young people that have been sentenced to long sentences or death in prison, that also is a penalty of death. To be deprived of your prison, of your freedom, and to be in prison 40 year sentences, life sentences thrown around. I sometimes think those words take less than two seconds to say, and I've been in courts where you see these people sentenced to 40 years, 50 years, life, without chance of parole. We have an overwhelmingly uh, a, a society bent on punishment, not on restoration. And Bishop is pointing us and all of us working, Karen Clifton, Catholic Mobilizing Network, people are moving toward we need to restore life, not to punish life and drive it into the ground and separate people from society. Prison is a terrible place. You are deprived of your freedom. You're deprived of a chance to grow. You, you meet hostility all around you constantly. I don't know why there are not more suicides in prison. There are a lot. So we need to be a life society. And I, I sign in every book, comes from Deuteronomy. I set before you life and death. Choose life that you may live. And go to the opera. I'll see you there on February 25th. <laughs> uh, no event occurs without a lot of effort. Uh, we'd like to thank the sponsoring organizations, the Catholic Mobilizing ne uh, Network, Equitas, the Washington National Opera, and our dear, dear hosts, at the Washington National Cathedral. We're so grateful for our panelists, the Reverend Dr. Gabe Silguero, Dr. Uma Mysorikar, Rabbi Hannah Goldstein, Bishop Marianne Buddy, uh, Bishop Frank DeWayne, and Imam Yahya Hendi. Um, immediately, um, at, when, at the close, we invite you to join us uh, for a reception over to my left. Uh, Sister Helen will be available to sign books which are being sold in the area to my right. I hope I have my left and right correctly in this case. Um, we invite you to the tables in the back to gather information about the death penalty and how you can get involved. You will also find more information about tickets for the upcoming premiere of the Dead Man Walking Opera. Um, we are very grateful for you uh, for, uh, for being here tonight, for the gift of your presence and your willingness to enter into the dialogue about the death penalty in the only Western democracy that still executes its citizens. And I'd just like to close with a brief prayer that Pope Francis gave uh, for opponents of the death penalty. And interestingly, he references uh, the same, uh, one of the stories from the Gospel of John that Bishop Buddy also referenced. Pope Francis said, I take my leave while entrusting you to the Lord Jesus, who in the days of his earthly life did not want his persecutors to be harmed in his defense. Put your sword back in it, into its place. He was captured and unjustly condemned to death, and he identified with all prisoners, whether guilty or not. I was in prison and you came to me, he said. May he who before the adulterous woman did not question her guilt, but invited the accusers to examine their own conscious consciences before throwing a stone at her, grant you the gift of wisdom in order that the action you undertake in favor of the abolition of this cruel punishment may be appropriate and fruitful. Good night and God bless. Thank you so much. <laughs>